Let me encourage you to go ahead and open your Bibles to Mark chapter 13. We're doing a verse-by-verse study through the book of Mark, and we're going to finish up chapter 13 this morning. At least that's the plan. So appreciate you following along with that. Also, I have a couple of more announcements to make, but I'm going to kind of save those to the end, if you don't mind. All right, so you're in Mark 13, and I've got a question for you. And I don't want you to feel any pressure to answer this question out loud, okay? So you can just sit there. Here's the question. Do you ever have trouble hearing God's voice? And I'm not talking about an audible voice. I'm, I'm talking more about kind of like a two-way conversation. I mean, we pray to God. We talk to God through prayer. Do you have trouble hearing back from him? I mean, sometimes I hear people say, God's not responding to me. And sometimes I find myself saying, I'm asking, but God's not really answering. And judging by questions on the internet, you and I aren't the only ones that kind of deal with that question. The question is asked in a lot of different ways. Why won't God speak to me? How do we get God to talk back? What do you do when God is not speaking? Or what do you do when God is silent? Why doesn't God talk to me? And does God still speak to us today? And here's kind of where I'm going with that whole thing. In our scripture text for this morning, we're in Mark 13, verses 28 through 37. And if you have a Bible like mine, every word in that particular section of scripture is read. Now, what does that mean? You can answer this question. It means Jesus is talking. Yeah, Jesus is speaking through that. And we know from Hebrews chapter 4 that God's Word is alive and it's active. So this book is alive for you and I, right? It's more than just words on a page. Well, listen to Isaiah 55 verse 11. I'm reading from the New Living Translation this morning. The prophet Isaiah says for the Lord... It's the same with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all that I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. And through the power of the Spirit, God has, and I believe he exercises the ability to meet each and every one of us right where we are. Uh, Pastor Neal said it in introducing the message last week. Where we're at is where we're at. I mean, God knows where we're at, and he has the ability to, to meet us there. So considering that our text this morning is straight from the lips of Jesus, and that God's written word is alive and active, would you agree with me that God has something to say to you and I this morning? Yes. I mean, that's what he does when we come together on Sunday morning. God uses two very different but very gifted men, two of the best expository teachers on the planet as far as I'm concerned, Pastor Neil and Pastor John, to bring his word to life for us on Sunday mornings. That's why we gather here. I've been here long enough to to go through the whole Bible with Pastor John. So if you you ask me about Pastor John, the first thing I'll say is he taught me God's Word. He did. And if you know God's Word, you know that every now and then he'll even speak through a donkey. I'm that guy today. (laughs) I'm your donkey. But wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait a minute. In spite of the messenger, I still have confidence that God has a message he wants to speak to us today. He does. And here's what I'm convinced he wants to say to his church, to you and I as we've gathered. 
Just as he said last week through Pastor John, wake up, church. There are three things I believe God wants us to hear very clearly this morning. The first of those is that Jesus is coming back. We should approach that whole topic with absolute certainty as his church. Next, he's coming back very soon. There's a sense of urgency that you're going to see in the passage we have this morning that we need to grab hold of, church. We need to be ready for that. And finally, you and I should be watching for Jesus. We should be ready when he comes back. So let's pray, and we're going to jump in the Word together. Well, Father, we thank you for your Word this morning. I thank you for the encouragement I've already received from it. Sometimes your Word hurts, <laughs> but this morning your Word is encouraging to the followers of Jesus Christ who have gathered here this morning. Lord, we can have confidence in the future. We can know what's coming our way. We can do what Jesus says. He says, I tell you, like I tell everyone, watch for him. Jesus speaking of himself. So, Father, I pray that you would have the freedom to speak here through your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray Isaiah 55, 11, over every person in this room. Lord, we ask you to send out your word today. It always produces fruit. To accomplish everything that you have planned to accomplish this morning in this body of believers. And Lord, that you would prosper your word in the lives of your people. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And considering this final portion of Jesus' teaching on the Mount of Olives, as with any scripture, context is critical. We've got to know where it's coming from. So to get the context, we're going to jump back briefly into Pastor John's message from last week. And chapter 12 ended with Jesus' teaching in the temple. Now, that was normal for Jesus. He did that pretty much everywhere he went. But as he was leaving the temple on this particular occasion, one of his disciples asked a question about the temple compound. More specifically, he was asking about the stones that were used in the construction of the temple. They're big stones. They're massive. The cut and quarried stones were so big that most modern construction equipment couldn't even deal with them. But the stones were just the beginning. The stones were covered with beautiful gold. And when the sun hit them, Pastor John last week said it was like a fiery flash on top of a mountain. And the marble blocks used in the temple were so pure white that Jewish historian Josephus says, if you were a stranger there, you would think it snowed on the temple. Brilliant white marble stones. The temple was a wonder of the ancient world. It was like this building called the Burj Khalifa. It's the pride of Dubai, and it's the tallest building in the world at this time. And that was the temple to the Jewish people. I mean, there was nothing like it in the world at that particular time. So imagine what went through the disciples' minds. Imagine what would go through your mind or my mind when Jesus answered and said, this is going to be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of the other. I mean, think about it. His response was so shocking that when they got to the Mount of Olives, Peter, James, John, and Andrew all teamed up Jesus, and they privately asked him, tell us when these things will happen. What sign will show us that these things are about to be fulfilled? And then in verses 5 through 27, Jesus tells them what the nation of Israel could expect before during and after a time the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. 
And it's in that context that Jesus says to his guys in verse 28, Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way where you can see all these things taking place, you can know that his return is very near. It's right at the door. Right at the door. So Jesus and his guys are up on the Mount of Olives. Another question for you. You can answer this one. What kind of trees are on the Mount of Olives? Olive trees. You may not have known this, but fig trees were also plentiful on the Mount of Olives. It could have been the Mount of Figs at some point. But fig trees, I, I don't know if you're familiar with fig trees, but these grew to 30 foot high. I've never seen a 30 foot high fig tree. And because we know that all this took place right before Passover, we know that the fig trees on the Mount of Olives would have been just as Jesus was describing them to his disciples. Their branches would have been tender and there would have been leaves sprouting. As he often did, Jesus used something that was kind of right in front of his listeners. And I think he's doing that in Scripture today as we go through this section. He used an illustration that was relevant and current because of the importance of what he's trying to communicate. Jesus wanted his guys to understand clearly what he was saying. He said, when these signs appear... And the signs are back in verse 24. The sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. He says, when all these things happen, you can know that his return is very near. It's right at the doors. See, Jesus wanted his, his guys, his followers to know, and I believe he wants you and I to know this morning, without a doubt, He's coming back. Jesus' long-awaited return to planet Earth to set up his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, is an absolute certainty. We can take confidence in that this morning. And listen, the signs Jesus gave to announce his return, and they're not open to interpretation. They're undeniably clear. And to a serious Jew, to a kid that had been reading and studying Scripture most of their life, especially the book of Isaiah, these signs were nothing new. Listen to how the prophet Isaiah described the day of the Lord's return. This is from Isaiah 13, verses 9 and 10, if you want to look back at it. Uh, written about 700 years before the time of Christ. Here's what the prophet said. For see, the day of the Lord is coming, the terrible day of his fury and his fierce anger. The land will be made desolate, and all the sinners will be destroyed with it. The heavens will be black above them. The stars will give no light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will provide no light. The prophet Isaiah said that 700 years before Jesus. So the first thing from our text this morning, I believe that Jesus wanted everyone to know and something that we can take with us and repeat often is that Jesus is coming back. True to his word, Jesus' return to earth is imminent. And let me tell you something, with everything that's going on in the world today, the world needs to hear that. They need to know that. And the second thing Jesus wants us to know, because our God is such a merciful God and a gracious God, because he's loving and he's patient with his kids, he's giving a warning so that everyone who's left on earth will know that this time is near. Verse 23 says, Watch out, I have warned you about these things ahead of time. And Jesus did warn them. He warned them at that time, and then he warned them through a prophet 700 years prior to that. 
And in these warnings, we can see for ourselves the compassion and the great patience of our God. Listen to this description of the Lord from Lamentations chapter 3. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. We hear that repeated over and over and over again in scriptures. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. The Lord is full of mercy. And his desire is that none would perish. That's what he would like to see. So he tells us, he says, keep watch. Now, join me back in our verse, uh, our text, verse 30. Verse 30 says, I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene before all these things take place. And verse 30 is a somewhat controversial verse in this section of Scripture, so I'm going to do my best not to bite off more than I can chew. The big question is, what generation is Jesus speaking of? He says, this generation. Is he making reference to the generation of his audience, to the generation that was listening to him at that time? Or is he talking about a future generation, one that's to come? Well, skeptics today would say Jesus was talking about the generation of his audience. See, they would discredit his reputation and authority by saying, you know what, his statement was untrue. That generation has already passed away. But beginning with verse 21, Jesus, at least in my simple mind, is clearly speaking about a time that's yet to come. It's a future event. So the generation to see all these things take place has yet to be defined. See, all these things have to take place before they can really set the clock in motion, before they can be defined. And then as an exclamation point to these future occurrences and Jesus' authority over them and everything else, he, he makes this proclamation in verse 31. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Even as the signs of the times reveal Jesus and bring kind of all things together leading toward his return, the certainties of our life on earth will begin to fall apart. And here's what I believe, and it's, it's just my personal opinion for your consideration. The force of Jesus, the King, the Messiah, the Son of God, sovereign and all-powerful, coming back to once again set his foot upon the earth is going to be so powerful that nature itself will have to respond. It's not it might respond. It's got to respond. How else would you explain a sun with no light and stars falling out of the sky? Some of you may know this about me. I've, I've done a bit of sailing in my past. In fact, racing sailboats was kind of one of the driving forces behind Anna and I relocating here from Birmingham, Alabama about 30 years ago now. And Anna would tell you I took all the fun out of sailing for her. She was all about the fun. Now, I'll never forget the day that my bride figured out why they call a sailboat boom a boom when it smacked her upside the head. She wasn't paying attention. <laughs> she was in it for the fun, but any time I got on board a sailboat, it was a race to me. So to that end, my, my OCD would kick in, and I, I began studying things that related to how fast a boat would go. I looked at the influence the wind has on a sail. I looked at how a hull moves through the water. And one of the most interesting things I learned was the fact that water prepares for a boat's hull before it actually gets there. It's true. I hope you'll check me on this. A ship's hull in moving or displacing water 
creates such a powerful force that the water ahead of the ship begins to part before the hull ever gets there. I did a bathtub demonstration to make sure of it. <laughs> it really does. And that's what I believe will happen as Jesus approaches planet Earth. Man, the wave that he's pushing, the force that's in front of him coming back to Earth will be so great that we'll see the laws that govern nature begin to fail. Ask any scientist. Man, when that happens, it's going to be catastrophic. Jesus said even though heaven and earth will disappear, his word will stand. And he's making a public proclamation here about the power of God's word. And I want us to get it. I want you to feel it this morning because it's important. God's word is the power of God made available to you and I every day. Imagine that. Man, we have the power of God available to us. Why wouldn't we take advantage of that? It's there anytime we want it. All we have to do is take it in. You know, one very positive thing that came out of the COVID catastrophe for our church, our community of faith here at Coastline, was the Daily in the Word devotionals. Man, they come out every day. Thank God in our little bubble that we've, for the most part, moved on from COVID. But I don't have to tell you, it rocked our world when it first hit us. I mean, we wore masks for the first time in my lifetime. We had government mandates for getting together in public places. Businesses began to shut down. You couldn't find a restaurant open for a few days. We even closed the church for a few Sundays. But listen, here's the good news about all that. It prompted us to start communicating differently as a church. We did church online. And to promote unity in the church and as a way for us to connect on a daily basis because we were so disconnected, our leadership team had the foresight to begin these daily devotions online. It was a very simple thought. And what came out of that was a systematic way of reading God's Word every day with a video devotion that went along to support it. And I'm so thankful because so many of you are watching those and you're reading a chapter in the Bible every single day. I mean, to this day, hardly a, a week goes by that someone doesn't say, man, that means so much to me in my spiritual journey. It's powerful because it's God's Word. That's why it's powerful. I mean, one of my favorite verses of all time, Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. So in a time when many of us were desperately in need of the power of God's peace, we found it by fixing our thoughts on God through his word. I mean, you're doing that today. You've set aside this time to come and worship the Lord and hear from his word. But you can do that every day. Did I mention how powerful that would be in your life? Every week, sometimes every day of the week, we have people call the office here at the church and say, hey, I, I need to speak to a pastor. And many times those people are looking for some semblance of peace in their lives. So I wanted to encourage you today, while I had the chance, before you get to that place, I know some of you have already been there, but take some time and spend in God's Word every day. It's a powerful thing. And if you're looking for a way to invest in your relationship with the Lord, to grow in that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, Man, that's your next step. That's your pathway to progress. That's getting you where you want to be. It's the power 
and the peace that you've been looking for in your life. It's the Word of God. Daily in the Word. We've got brochures out in the foyer this morning. We've got them online. You can check that out. But back to our text now. Verse 32. Jesus says, however... And here's what he's saying. He's saying, even though we can know the signs of these future events, Jesus returned to our world. No one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. And since you don't know when that time will come, be on guard, Jesus says. Stay alert. And I believe that any time the Word of God is taught or spoken, there's kind of a natural response for those of us who are submitted to the authority of Jesus. Mark talked about the authority of Jesus in chapter 11. And he said that the leading priest of that day, the teachers of religious law and the elders, they just didn't get it. They didn't understand it was an all or nothing thing. So if we've submitted our lives to Jesus, here's the response I think he'd expect from you and I today based on his word. He says it himself. He says, be on guard. Stay awake. Be watching, another translation says. What are we watching for? We're watching for Jesus. And the implication here is that there's the danger of being surprised by these future events. But if we're watching, if we're alert, if we're on guard, that's not going to happen. Jesus wants his people to be ready for the future. And I think it's interesting how God's word proves once again to be eternal for all time and for all ages. I love what pastor and Bible commentator David Guzik said about that. He said, when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D., those who had listened to and obeyed Jesus escaped a horrible destruction that came upon the city. When it comes to far greater destruction that will come upon the whole earth, those who listen to and obey Jesus can escape the horrible destruction that's still to come. See, our future, yours and mine, as followers of Jesus, I believe, is to be caught up in the air with Jesus. It's the rapture of the church when his church is kind of snatched away from the earth and the world as we know it is consumed by evil. You know, in the the day and age that we live in, we still have good people around that do good things. Even some people that are not necessarily godly people, they're they're good people, they're nice people, and they do good things with their life. But listen, in that day, when evil consumes the earth, good people will have to do evil things just to stay alive, just to hang in there. God clearly doesn't want you and I to be here when his wrath is poured out. So much so that we'd have to totally disregard who Jesus is to be left to deal with the the event called the Great Tribulation. But his love is so great, it even extends to those who will experience this time of evil on earth. We won't be here. I firmly believe that. But I believe he's warning those who will be. God is giving them another chance to surrender their life to him before he returns to the earth to judge and to set up his heavenly kingdom. God always gives another chance. So we're winding down and Jesus shares one more parable beginning in verse 34. He says, The coming of the Son of Man can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. When he left home, he gave each of his slaves instructions about the work they should do. And he told the gatekeeper to watch for his return. 
you too must keep watch. For you don't know when the master of the household will return, in the evening, at midnight, before dawn, or at daybreak. Don't let him find you sleeping when he arrives without warning. I say to you what I say to everyone, watch for him. And repetition in scripture always translates into importance. Jesus wanted his followers to know and understand what he was saying. So again, Jesus says to his disciples, I believe he was saying to those in the future, he was saying to you and I today, hey, watch for my return. And this is the application part of hearing God's word today. We need to be actively watching for Jesus every day. In the first chapter of the gospel account, Mark, the writer, documents another announcement of Jesus. Here's what Jesus said at that time. The time promised by God has come at last. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. And having done that, having repented of your sins and believed the good news, I believe there are three things that Jesus wants you and I to take away with us today. Three simple things. One, he's coming back. Just as John wrote that we can know that we have eternal life in Christ, Mark writes here, you can know that his return is very near. It's right at the door. And my hope, my prayer is that no one would leave here today without firmly believing that Jesus is coming back. Amen. Second, Jesus wants you to feel a sense of urgency, I believe, in his announcement. He stresses it. He says he's right at the door. I mean, this is not back burner stuff we're talking about. It's word that demands a response from you and I. So Jesus tells us how to respond, and that's the third thing. It's not so much an intellectual takeaway. You don't remember it and kind of go out the doors with it. It's a do it now kind of thing. What do we do? Well, we watch for him. We watch for Jesus to come back. We're ready and waiting. We're living every day in anticipation of his soon return. How do you do that? Well, I want to suggest just a very simple way to do that for the next week. Here's the deal. Get up every morning and start your day by reading the words of Jesus in verse 37. It's a simple verse. It says, Jesus speaking, I say to you what I say to everyone. Watch for him. Watch for me. And here's the thing. Man, if you set your mind in that place that Jesus is coming back, that he's coming back soon and that he wants you to be watchful for that time, it'll change everything that you do. It'll change your perspective on your life. Man, you'll remember it through the day. You'll think about it when you're having to make critical decisions. And you'll say, well, what? What should I do based on this reality in my life? So it's a simple thing, and I would, I would hope that you would test the Lord on this. It's not testing me. But Jesus said, I say to you what I say to everyone, watch for him. Watch for my coming back is what he's doing. I believe if you'll start your day, you'll get your mind set on that before all the things of the world start creeping in on you. I hope your mind does that. Mine does. Then you'll change your perspective on life. I believe it'll change your life if you'll do it. In the first part of Mark chapter 13, we're given an action item. Remember, Pastor John said it last week. Wake up, church. 
And here in the last part of the chapter, there's another action item, another imperative, something that we need to do as time draws close, and that's to keep watch. So here's my encouragement, church. Keep on watching for the return of Jesus Christ. Don't get complacent. Don't get lazy in that. Keep on watching. Live your life in anticipation of Jesus soon coming because he's right at the door.